Hey, Tyson here from Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. Thank you for listening to our message today. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships. For more resources and information about Refuge, please visit us on the web at refugeph.com. All right, we've been talking about uh, our identity. It's interesting that the, the D-Now theme was born identity, but now we want to move in to thinking about Easter. And I kept thinking about Easter and preparing for that week. I mean, it's called Holy Week. There's all these things that, that go on this week to remind us of Jesus and what he did. And as TC mentioned, today is Palm Sunday. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that represents, how these people worship Jesus as he was riding into Jerusalem to the cross for that last week. Passion Week, I guess, is what you is what some people call it. And as we look at this time that Jesus is headed towards the cross, and we look at this week, we're going to see Jesus encounter six or seven different people or people groups and how they respond to him. I think it's interesting that in Matthew, if you just follow along on who he encounters, and then Jesus tells these stories, it really begins to make the Bible clear sometimes in, in what Matthew, the writer, and what God is trying to say through Matthew. So we're going to be in, in Matthew chapter 20 and 21 today. We're going to finish in Colossians chapter 2 because I was torn between two sermons you're getting to today. But I'm going to get you out on time, I hope. So uh, the reason I have two sermons today is because this last verse that I want to cover in Colossians, every time I think about disciple now, I think about this verse. Because I remember sitting right up there in that room on the third floor and, and the speaker mentioning this verse. And it has stood out to me every, ever since about what Jesus Christ does for us. So as, as, we look about, as we think about what Jesus Christ is doing in this Easter week as he's headed towards the cross, I want you to see this. Look at Matthew chapter 20 verse 17. <clears throat> it says, while going up to Jerusalem, Jesus took the twelve disciples aside privately and said to them, on the way. See, we are going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priest and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised. I want us to understand this first and foremost. Jesus knew exactly what he was headed towards. When he got on that donkey and started headed towards Jerusalem, he knew exactly what laid ahead for him. And he knew it was going to be a tough week. So we have to begin to ask ourselves, why would he do that? Why would he do that? And then we're going to see these people that he encounters on the way. And here's what I want you to do today. As we think about preparing for Easter, and we see Jesus preparing for Easter, he has these encounters with these different people who have these different ideas about who Jesus is or different needs, if you will, from Jesus. I want to see if you find yourself... In one of these people. I don't want you to come here today and say, okay, I'm listening to this. Well, that's about so and so. Really, you know, so and so should really hear that. That's about them. No, I, I want you to, to be introspective today about yourself. Focus only on yourself today and where you see yourself in where we are in these people that Jesus encounters. Because I, as I begin to think about it, I begin to see myself sometimes in some of these people, maybe even more than one. So let's look through this. So the very next verse, Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, we see the first encounter. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her sons. She knelt down and asked him for something. What do you want? He asked her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and one on the left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? We are able, they said. Now in this passage, I sort of see two different people groups here. Uh, sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're different. But what you see here is you see the mother going to bat for the sons. Now they're there with her. So it's not like she's promoting it and they don't know about it. It's almost like they told her to go to Jesus. Hey, we don't want to approach Jesus. Would you go do this for us? And, and part of what I see in this passage is there are people who think that they're Christians... Because their parents are Christians. They're, they're living through their parents. When I went to Ukraine, it's probably been, I think it was 2013, 10 years ago. We began to study that culture. And, and they said, when you go to Ukraine and you ask people if they're a Christian, their answer is going to be yes, 100%. 
None of them know anything about Jesus. They don't know anything about God. They don't go to church. They don't do any of those things. But when you ask them, are they Christians, here's why they'll answer that they're a Christian. Because in the 1300s, some ruler that they had uh, became a Christian and he got baptized in the Dnieper River and declared the Ukraine nation a Christian nation. And they're born in Ukraine, so they're Christians. And quite honestly, we, th- we look at that and we think, well, that's crazy. But we realize that there are people here. We live in what used to be the Bible Belt. There is no Bible Belt anymore. Uh, we've all outgrown our Bible Belt. It, it doesn't exist. But people who've grown up in this area sometimes think that, well, I go to church because my parents went to church. Or I'm a Christian because my parents are a Christian. Can I tell you that it doesn't work that way? Like, we have to make a decision for ourselves about what to do with Jesus. So that's part of what we see in the picture. The other thing we see in this passage is we see people who are looking for maybe some status, right? Hey, can I sit at your right hand and your left hand? Like, like I, they want Jesus to do something for them. Like, help me out here. Increase my status. Help me uh, be somebody. And, and, and Jesus goes on to tell these guys, hey, uh, if, if you don't understand what's going on here, he says, oh, by the way, the first will be last and the last will be first. And I came not to, to be served, but to serve. That's literally what Jesus tells them next. And he's trying to show them that, hey, this, this idea of following Jesus is not so much about you and you gaining something. Yes, we gain Christ. And yes, we gain righteousness. And yes, we gain all these things. But it's what he did for us, not what we did. And I don't want us to fall into that trap to being caught where uh, we think that uh, putting our faith and trust in Jesus makes our life better. And I've said this a lot. Sometimes following Jesus makes our life harder. And in the world that we live in, the political climate, it's only going to get even harder. So here's what we have to do. I want you to think about this. Maybe today you're in that position. You may say, well, you know, I've never really decided on my own if I'm a Christian. I've just came because my parents always came to church. I want you to, to answer this question. What have you done with Jesus Christ? Have you made a decision about Jesus for yourself? Because it's important. Now let's look at the next group. Verse 29 of Matthew chapter 20. It says, As they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd, a large crowd followed him. And there were two blind men sitting by the road. Now, I don't feel like I need to explain this, but let me explain this. They're blind. You know that means they can't see, right? Now, here's why I say that. They've seen no miracles. All this stuff that Jesus has done that we get to read about, they've seen none of it with their own eyes. We're going to see a contrast with people who have seen Jesus do miracles. The Pharisees, Jesus performed a lot of miracles in front of these religious people. And here we've got these two guys who have seen nothing that Jesus has done. All they've heard is about him. And now they hear him walking by. They hear that he's walking by and this is what it says. It says, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd demanded that they keep quiet, but they cried out all the more. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And Jesus stopped and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, they said to him, open our eyes. And then moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they could see. What these two men needed more than anything was mercy. And maybe that's you. Mercy is is defined as rendering aid. Or, or helping somebody. Mercy can also be described, grace is described as getting something you don't deserve. Mercy is being described as getting, not getting something that you do deserve. Now these guys being blind would have felt like outcasts because the culture of the day said that if there was something physically wrong with you, that that was God's punishment on you and you must have done something wrong. So that's, that's the way these guys felt. Is that they had done something wrong and they needed mercy. And maybe that's you. Maybe you understand that you need mercy. And you see how Jesus responded. He responds to people who need mercy with compassion. You know what compassion is? Compassion is love in action. It's more than just saying he's going to do something. Jesus is going to do something about it. That's what compassion is. So maybe that's you. Maybe what you need today is mercy. 
Then we see somebody else he runs into in, in Matthew chapter 21. You, you turn over to the next chapter and Jesus is, is, tells his disciples, Hey, you're going to go into town. You're going to find these donkeys. I want you to bring them out. They're, <coughs> everything's set up. You're going to bring them out. And then I'm going to ride them in. So they, they go out and they get the donkeys. They bring them in. By the way, this Savior, you think about the Savior of the world. He's not riding in on some big white horse, some big stallion like a conqueror. And, and, and we're going to see what that causes. He's riding in on a donkey. Like when you think of like Wide Earp or Gladiator, the movie. Like you can see him in the Gladiator in the arena and there's lions and tigers. And this guy comes out on his donkey and he's like, yeah. They're like, that, that guy's not going to win. But, but this is the idea of Jesus coming in this humble way, right? So look at this, verse 7. It says, They brought the donkey and the colt. And then they laid their clothes on them, and he sat on them. Them being the clothes, not the donkeys, both. He couldn't sit on them both. A, a very large crowd spread, spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. That's the idea of Palm Sunday. They cut these palm branches down. They laid them on the ground in front of them. This, the palm branches were signs. It's a Jewish national symbol. Like you're the king. You're the savior. You're the one who's going to come and kick these Romans out. It says, then the crowds went ahead of him. And, they, the, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest of heaven. You, you look at this and you see these people celebrating Jesus, but, but you really got to go on with the story and realize that just a week later, none of these people are anywhere to be found. When Jesus needed them, they were yelling, crucify him. So there are people who can, who can worship Jesus, but they're worshiping the wrong kind of Jesus. Because what the Savior that they expected was a military Savior. He's going to come in here and he's going to kick these Romans out. We're going to have a Jew back as king and it's going to be a great day. And that's what they were expecting. So when Jesus didn't turn out to be the Savior that they thought he was going to be, they bailed on him. Maybe you're here today and you're looking for a different kind of Savior. Maybe you're looking for a Savior that is going to Benefit you in some way that, you know, there's the whole idea of health and wealth that if you come to Jesus, you'll be blessed and you'll get money and you'll have all these things. Can I tell you that that's not the way it works? Jesus came and said, you, it will cost you things to follow me. So what kind of savior are you looking for? See, these, these people were looking for the wrong kind of savior. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're looking for a different kind of savior. Then you look at verse 10. It says, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar, saying, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Maybe you're here today and you're just trying to figure out who this Jesus guy is. Maybe you're just curious. You've heard about Jesus. Maybe you've heard your parents talk about Jesus. You've heard other people talk about Jesus and you just want to check it out. You're not a believer. This is a great place for you. Because what I want to do is I want to tell you the truth about who Jesus is so that you can make a decision for yourself. This is a safe place to be curious about who Jesus is. Because that's our goal here is to tell you about who Jesus is and share the hope of Jesus Christ to you. And then you can make a decision for yourself. Maybe that's you, just curious. Next, verse 14. It says, the blind and the lame, now Jesus is in Jerusalem, he's in the temple. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Maybe this is you. Maybe you're here and you've been hurt. Maybe it's physical healing you need, but maybe it's spiritual, emotional. Maybe you've been hurt in some way by people that you trusted. And, and, and you think about that and you say, that's who I identify with. When we think about Jesus going to the cross, he's going to the cross for people like you who've been hurt. Jesus was hurt. Jesus was betrayed. Jesus had been spit on. Jesus was mocked. That's the kind of Savior that we're for. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're here today and you've been hurt. I'll say this about healing. Healing doesn't happen overnight. We think about Brittany. We've seen God do a work in, in Brittany's life. She's still in the hospital. And, and her, her healing takes time. Listen, healing takes time. 
But if we go to the right place, we go to Jesus, we can see healing take place. Maybe that's why you're here. Next, look at verse 15. When the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonders that he did, and the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Now there's two groups of people in this passage. I want to look at the first one. The first one's children. These children see what Jesus has done and they immediately believe. Childlike faith. Maybe you're here today and you're here with childlike faith. For you, I would tell you to do nothing else. Because what God wants from us is childlike faith. Yes, I saw Jesus. I believe He's the Savior. And I'm going to follow Him. It's really that simple. Come to Jesus Christ with childlike faith. Then the second person we see in this passage, we see these religious people. The chief priest. Look at them in verse 13. Let me read that verse again. When the chief priest... And the scribes saw wonders that he did, and the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. They got mad at Jesus for healing somebody. Think about that. Oh, we we didn't want you to be healed. We, We don't want you to get better. We don't want any of that in here. Think about that. And he said to them, Do you hear what these children are saying? Jesus replied, yes. Have you never read that, the, the, that you have prepared a praise, uh, praise from the mouths of infants and nursing babies? Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. So you see this contrast, okay? You can't help but see it when you look at this passage as a whole. You got the disciples who were like, yeah, I, I want to be at your right hand. I want to be at your left. You've got the, the blind The two blind guys, you know, they can't see. They didn't see any miracles. Like, they put their faith and trust in Jesus immediately. You've got people who are hurt and who need mercy, and they cry out to Jesus, and He has compassion on them. You've got children who put their faith in Him. And then you've got these religious guys, and they're mad. I guess my question for us is, could we be the religious person? And, and you're sitting here, you're saying to yourself, no, that's not me. But let me continue on because Jesus doesn't just stop here. He tells us this little story about a fig tree. And he's pointing back to these religious guys. Okay, look at what he says. Verse 18. Early in the morning, as he was returning to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he went up to it and found nothing on it except leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. At once the fig tree withered. Now you read that and you're like, what in the world is going on right there? Here's what Jesus is pointing out. This lone fig tree, it had its leaves. The way a fig tree works is typically it bears fruit before its leaves come into fully develop. So here's Jesus walking down the road and he sees a lone fig tree. Symbolic of the Jewish church. They had all the right conditions. The soil was right. They were standing by themselves. They were leafy. It looked like it was healthy. But it had nothing on it. So when we talk about this idea of these religious guys who were mad. Maybe you're not a a religious person who gets mad when things like that happen. Maybe you're a religious person that... Maybe you'd look good on the outside, but there's absolutely nothing on the inside. What that looks like is is that it becomes religion, not relationship. It becomes, well, i got to do this because that's what we're supposed to do. And I'm going to do this because that's what we're supposed to do. And there's no real relationship with Jesus Christ. Like, like you're, you're, we're giving God lip service, but we don't really follow Him during the week. Could that be us? We begin to look at this. and we be, we, You think about this idea of these leaves. These leaves are out there bragging. Hey, we're, we're out here. We got leaves. Look, everything's going great. Look at me. But there was nothing on the inside. And I got news for you. If that's the way that we're going to follow Jesus, it becomes drudgery. And it's not meant to be that way. Because following Jesus Christ is so much more than that. This is what Jesus is trying to teach them. And that that kind of religion becomes about self. Hey, look at me and look what I did. 
We begin to do things so that other people will brag about the things that we did. And we go home and we never spend time with Jesus. And we don't know him any more than we did two years ago. Is that us? Well, the good news is he gives us a solution. Keep reading. Look at verse 28. So Jesus begins to tell him a story. He says, what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, my son, go to work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I don't want to go. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the man went, in the other, uh, went to the other son and said the same thing. I will, sir, he answered, but he didn't go. Which of these two did the father's will? And they said to the first, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. Tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. But you, when you saw it, didn't even change your minds then and believe him. So here's a commentary on everything that we just read. There are people who need mercy who cry out for a Savior. There are people who need healing who cry out for a Savior. There there are people, there are children who just go to Jesus in simple faith. And then there are these religious guys who act like they don't even need a Savior. And that's their real problem. They didn't think they needed a Savior. Because you know what? It became about them. Look at me. One of the biggest things that we struggle with in in America today is there are people who believe that I'm good enough to go to heaven. We're not. And even that idea is hell-bent when you think about it. After what Jesus Christ did for us. So we begin to look at this passage and we begin to look at all these things. I want to ask you a question. Where are you in this story? Which one of these are you? Do you desire status? Or maybe you're here because your parents. Maybe you're like the two blind men. You just need mercy. It's a great place to be. We all need mercy. Truth of the matter is. Maybe you're like the crowd who's, who's shouting Hosanna. But when Jesus was crucified, they were nowhere to be found. You're looking for the wrong kind of Savior. Maybe you're here, you're, you're here and you're curious. You're just trying to figure out about this Jesus guy. Maybe you're here and you're like the blind and the lame. You need healing. It's a great place for you. Maybe you're here and you're like a child. You want to have the faith of a child. It's a great place for you. Maybe you're here and you're like a Pharisee and you're religious. When you really begin to examine the New Testament, you know who Jesus had the biggest problem with? It's the religious people who didn't think they even needed a Savior. That's not a good place to be. It's called self-righteousness. And it can be a huge hurdle to truly following Jesus. It can get in the way of following Jesus because we can say, Hey, look what I did. Yeah, I'll go help there so people can see us. And then we go home and we never spend time with Jesus. And it's empty. It's a fig tree with leaves and no fruit. I'm going to ask TC and the band to come up here. And I want to finish with this last verse. I told you I was going to get two sermons in. This last one's short. And it sort of wraps up this whole idea. When you begin to think about where we are in this story, and you say, I, I, I may be one of those religious people that, yeah, I, I, maybe I, I believe in Jesus, but I have made it about me. Or, or, or maybe you're here and you're like, oh, man, I've, I've, I've lost my way. I'm not following Jesus like I should, or whatever it is. Whatever it is that you carry in here, I want to give you some good news. And that's why I love this verse so much in Colossians chapter 2. We talk about answering the question, why did Jesus walk towards the cross? I couldn't help but think about this. This is a, this is a biblical imagination. That's what I'll call this. This is not biblical. This is my biblical imagination. But there were two donkeys, right? He only rode one of them. You know what I think was on the second donkey? All my crap. All my junk. I think that's what he was taking with him. Is all my stuff. Look at this verse. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, He erased the certificate of debt with its obligation 
that is against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. You know what this verse says? It says, He took what I owed and He nailed it to the cross. Paid for. He took my obligations. You know, those things that I felt like I needed to do. Nailed it to the cross. What else does it say? It says He took those things that are against us and opposed to us. Do any of you feel like the world is against you? Are there things that are against you? Listen, some of you have grown up in homes that are difficult. And it has made life hard for you. And there's been things that have been done to you by people who you cared about. And it is things that are against you. You know what Jesus did on the cross? Nailed it to the cross. You don't have to carry it anymore. He carried it for you and He nailed it to the cross. It's over. It's finished. Paid for. We think about Easter. This is what He did for us. I want to, as we think about Easter in this Holy Week, I want us to prepare our hearts and our minds for this week. And begin to say, this is what it means to follow Jesus. It's to come to Him and say, I need mercy. I need I need compassion. I need healing. I need you. That more than anything, we're desperate for Him. And when we go to Him in that way, that's something He'll respond to. Not, I don't need you. Look at me. And if that's been you, He can nail that to the cross too. Think about that story He told. There were, the first person said, no, I'm not going to go. But they changed their mind. The, first, the second son said, yeah, I'll go and didn't. Be the first one. Maybe you didn't go at first, but change your mind. You can follow him now. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. God, we come to you today, God, just people maybe who need healing, maybe who need mercy, maybe people who are just curious about who you are. And God, I hope that we painted an accurate picture of who you are. I I pray that we showed people the hope that can be found in Jesus Christ that it's not a religion that to do things to say look at me and look at how great my leaves look but it's meant to be a relationship where we come to you day in day out and say God I need you today having a relationship with Jesus is sitting down in front of him every day and saying Jesus I can't make it through the day without you whatever sin it is that you struggle with whatever it is that you're carrying we take it to him every day And say it's yours. Nail it to the cross. And God, I pray that this, even this week, that we begin to look out for people who need hope. And we invite them back next week so that they can hear about the hope of Jesus. And we begin to display a relationship with you that we can have. And it will rub off on other people. And they'll want the same thing that we have. God, I pray that happens today. Be with our students, God, as you've worked in their lives, that they understand that it's about a relationship, that they can speak with you every day, that they can pray with you when they're hurting, when they feel alone, that they can reach out to you and they can give it to you and you can nail it to the cross. God, I'm thankful for those students who made a decision and help us as a church to disciple them and help them to grow and to be better followers of you. Be with us as a church today, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this message today brought to you by Refuge Church. Please visit our website for more resources as well as our YouTube channel. Just search for Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee to find us. We hope that this message has helped you find hope in Jesus Christ.